tester.co.uk. Hello YouTubers and welcome to this tutorial on crimping, connectors, perhaps a bit of heat shrink, the use of tools to strip wire and how best to actually get your wire properly into your connectors so that it makes a good sound connection and is mechanically strong as well. So that's what I hope to achieve in this video. I'm going to go through some of the uh, mistakes that I have certainly made in the past with connecting uh, connectors and wires together. I'm also going to point down below to a very good reference, a NASA reference, which will be on my forum for discussions for those of you who might have better pearls of wisdom after seeing this video. And after you've seen this video, if you think you have some important advice or a better way of doing things, certainly do consider posting a comment below or even posting a video response showing how you think it should be done or even showing where it's gone wrong because that would be really handy too. But anyway, let's get down onto the bench. Right, so invariably, if you're working with either electrical or electronics, there comes a time when it's really handy to have a crimp-on connector to fulfill a certain function. You may want to have a wire that can go onto a battery terminal. You may want to join two wires with either spade connectors onto batteries. So there are loads of uses, but if it's done incorrectly, things can go awry. Case in point, here I have a homemade fuse holder and an automated fuse that I use in a system I was using to monitor current and voltage from a solar panel. And things can go very wrong quickly and they, this could result in a fire. So that's what you want to be wary of. So what I hope to cover in this video is just to give a demonstration of some of the tools which might be handy and a demonstration of, kind of some of the wiring and the crimps and the best practice that I know of in terms of joining a, a crimp connector to a piece of wire and what you need to be aware of. Now we're going to pick up because even this piece of wire that I have in my hand, which is a fairly large piece of wire, there are potentially issues with this connector and the way it's been done on this wire. But we'll cover that off. But let's start off with the piece of wire and actually stripping it. Right, so what you probably end up with then is you have a piece of wire and you have a connector, a crimp connector that you want to attach to your end of wire so that you can either connect it to a battery or what have you. So the first thing we need to do is strip the piece of wire so that we've got the conductor exposed so it can go into the actual crimp connector itself. Now ultimately this is what we want to end up with is a, the installation being cleanly removed with all your conductors intact so that you've got the maximum cross-sectional area of your conductor that goes into your crimp so that you don't lose the ampicity, the ability for the wire to carry a good current without any issues of resistance or heat while it's in the crimp connector. Not only that, if you don't do this correctly and you don't have enough conductor here, your actual mechanical holding of this into the crimp connector can be an issue. And believe it or not, crimping can be a far better solution than soldering. So you get a very good strong mechanical connect connection and electrical connection if it's done correctly. Right, so let's look at how we'd potentially strip this wire. Now then, I'm going to show you the tools that you might potentially consider. I've used them in the past. You might get a pair of pliers, and you've got the cutters and what we invariably try and do is get the cutters and try and strip the wire that way and invariably I probably don't have to show you what's going to happen when you do that you invariably start cutting a few of the conductors and losing shards all over the place a couple of points of danger there shards of big copper like this if they fall into uh, something you work a project that you're working on nearby or into an appliance they can cause a short and that's one issue and obviously then they don't provide enough of a conductor to properly carry the current that you require. Then you can end up with a cheaper crimping tool like this one over here and as you can see it actually says wire stripper over here and it has the little holes where you can go and strip the wire so what you would do is obviously place the wire in there, squeeze it 
and then remove the covering. But invariably with these types of strippers, if you use them carefully, that can be fine. But you, it can still be a challenge to do it correctly to remove the actual insulation from the wire itself. So what I have found to be a really valuable tool is to go and find yourself a good kind of what I'd call automated wire stripper. It has a mechanical grip to grip the wire over here as you squeeze down. It's got the correct size holes and then you use it and it strips off the insulation. So let's just give that a bash. So if I put it there, I know I've got to use the biggest hole there. And you want to test this. If you're not too sure of the hole, test it and make sure that it works correctly. So as you see, as I put it in, it bites down. It's also gripping the wire at the back here. And as I do it, there we go. It's pulled off the insulation. There's no free wires which have been broken off in there. I've got all my conductors intact, ready to use. So I can really recommend this for one, for doing it correctly. For two, if you've got a lot of wire that you're stripping, it becomes a pain trying to do it mechanically with a pair of pliers or side cutters. This makes life a lot easier. Right, so now we get to the next point where we've got our crimp connector. I've got my wire, which I've nicely stripped. And now I want to obviously place it in there and crimp it together. But I've got a slight problem. My conductor seems to be bigger than the actual gauge or the opening on my crimp connector. Now, how many times would you try and twist that on to force it in to get it in there and then try and crimp it? Or even, and I've done this, you can see what happens, it starts to bird cage. You get a thinner piece of conductor that goes into the crimp connector. You potentially have wires bird caging up on the side here which can act as a short hazard if they're out on the side. And invariably, what can be done is you get a set of strippers and you try and strip out some of that extra wire to allow it to fit into your connector. And the two issues there, for one, you've obviously reduced the current carrying capability of this piece of wire. And potentially, mechanically, you may have an issue with how well it's held inside your connector. So you do want to si find the right size connector. This one's too small. Right, so that one was too small, so I've now found a nice, beefy, solid lug end. Crimp connector, and it certainly does have a nice gauge opening. And look, my conductor fits in there very nicely, but it's a little loose. So i tell you what, there's a, perhaps a solution to this. Let me show you. It does mean I have to strip a little more of the insulation off the wire, but let's see how we go. <clears throat> so first off, there's one risk. Now when I'm trying to strip the wire the second time and not doing it correctly, I'm potentially going to lose some of those conductors which are really important. So my idea is that I can, I should be able to just fold this over and it should create a far tighter fit. Now there's a couple of risks with doing this. If I really mechanically bend this and squeeze it, I know I'll get it inside this lug. But that potentially doesn't create the proper full fit inside the actual crimp connector itself and it may mechanically compromise the actual tight fit inside here. So that you certainly don't want to do. You also don't want to go and fold the copper over the insulation and let's say we've got a bigger lug like this so you go and fold it over so that you can then force it inside and use the actual insulation on the wire as part of the holding because now you've reduced the surface area of the conductor that's actually going to touch the inside of this connector and again potentially compromise the mechanical grip once you've actually crimped this. So that's something you certainly don't want to do. Also the one important point whether it's with a lug like this if you get any bird caging and these wires poking out the bottom Again, huge risk 
for shorting something else, especially if you've got lugs close together and these are dangling about like that. You certainly don't want to do that. Right, so I've gone and found a crimp connector which I think matches perfectly this piece of wire. If we look inside, the gauge seems to be about right. If I insert the actual wire and conductor, it goes in without bird caging. It seems to have a nice snug fit. As you can see, what you do want to achieve with this is to, is to ensure that your conductor does poke out just a little bit on the side in the front end of your connector. You don't want it to extend too much or, or it's going to interfere with the connection over here and that's an issue. And particularly I'll show you just now with the battery lug connectors if they extend too much and you putting this on a battery you're not going to get the full mechanical contact and that's electrical contact when you've actually got it connected to let's say a battery. Now then I know that this wire is six in terms of the cross-sectional area it's six millimeters squared so in terms of a gauge it sits around nine or ten now then so the one thing to look for even though this mechanically does fit in nicely one wants to be sure that this can, is obviously made for that gauge and can carry the current because this can carry a fair amount of current so what you want to look for is on the connector itself you can select these connectors by the gauge of wire they're designed for and if you can read on the bottom there it actually says 12 to 10. So I'm just within the limits of the, the wire fitting in here and being able to be mechanically held correctly and being able to carry the current load on here. So that's something you want to look for. You want to look for the gauge, the, the American wire gauge rating on your connectors and ensure that you're matching, matching up the gauge of wire correctly onto this. Right, so our next chore is to go and crimp, use, find a crimping tool so we can actually crimp our connector onto this wire. Now there's a few things to note. You obviously do get the, the cheaper tools and fair enough they can work. This one hap happens to be noted in metric so what it's noting here is the size, the cross-sectional size, so four to six millimeters squared, which obviously relates to this connector over here. There's also color coding, as you can see, on these tools. This tool also color coded so you can easily match up. You can see the yellow connector over there. We've got the blue for the smaller cross-sectional area and you can go down to red as well. Now, these tools are this one over here does not have a ratchet system so you have to apply a lot of mechanical force and muscle sometimes to try and get something crimped together especially with the uh, larger conductors and sometimes that can mean you kind of mash things up you don't apply equal pressure or you get tired and you just don't do it correctly so certainly it's very handy getting a ratcheted tool which can open up you can hear the ratchet you can then place the tool in with the wire and you then crimp it together and as you crimp it a ratchet is holding so even if you're getting tired and you need to release it'll still hold it tight you can then continue and finish the actual crimping process so let's give that a bash with this one so right, what I tend to do with this because it can be a bit of a fiddly job if you've obviously got a few hands the one thing you want to note also on this crimp, before we put it in there, you're crimping the top. It's, got, it's designed for the top to be crimped, not the bottom. So you're crimping from the top to get a good mechanical connection in there so that you get a good all-round electrical connection with this as well. So on this tool, it's quite handy. It fits in quite nicely in the setting over here. I just close it enough so that it's gripped. It's not being crushed. So it allows me to free my one hand to then insert the wire. As I insert the wire, I'm ensuring that it's not going to birdcage or pull any of the, the actual wires back. If it is, I need to pull it back and correct that. It's gone in. You can see it's at the tip there. And I'm now in a position where I can grab this, making sure this doesn't slip out. I've grabbed it. It's now physically held it. Now I've got a problem. I don't have strong hands. So for me to crimp this with one hand 
is an issue. So I've just crimped enough for it not to fall out. It's in the right place. I can then grab two hands and finish off the process. And it only allows you to release once you're done. So here we go. And what you want to do and check, and I'm going to show you this on camera, there seems to be a fairly nice even distribution of the crimping tool on this connector. The way it fits into that tool is to ensure that it does crimp and grab in the right places. It crimps the actual plastic at the back here so that it's, there's a bit of strain relief on the connection and obviously ensures that it pushes down the actual uh, metal part of the connector to actually mechanically grab that wire nicely. And you do want to check that once you've got it crimped on, you want to give it a good old tug and make sure there's no play in there and that it's not going to come off. There's a few things you want to be wary of with these uh, smaller lugs or connectors and that mechanically sometimes the crimping tool can damage them. You can see this one is slightly bent and that you need to be aware of because if it's bending your crimps you may not have the right crimp or may not have the right size and that may cause a fatigue or a fracture here and that you certainly don't want. Right now let's have a look at this example. This is a fairly hefty piece of cable. It would be it's something which is perhaps particularly designed to be used on a DC battery. It's 10 millimeters squared, so this can probably handle uh, 100 amps, DC amps, through this. It's also got a silicone coating on it, and that's something to be aware of in your wire selection because the silicone coating can handle higher temperatures. You certainly don't want to be in that situation where you are catering for higher temperatures. You want to get the correct gauge for the current you're handling. But silicone certainly does give you a little bit of belts and braces, a bit of safety margin. Now there's a couple of issues with this whole setup here. As you can see, this is a, a kind of green and yellow piece of cable. And this, strictly speaking, should be used as an earth because of the color. But I didn't have... I couldn't get hold of a red cable so as you can see I just went and stuck a label on here and called it positive. Now there's a few issues with that. For one someone else might not be easily spot this and realize that it's positive and that could create a bit of an issue. Two, I've used a lug on here which obviously fits but mechanically it's not very strong. You can see how I can bend it and we've got a fairly heavy piece of wire on here. And that invariably can create its own hassles. We just want to make sure that, for one, can this lug actually carry the, the potential 100 amps that would be passing through here. And if this is connected on a battery and it's heavy and this is happening, well, guess what? In time, this lug is going to break off. Also, one, one method of getting around this issue where I couldn't find the right cable would be to, let's say, get a good long piece of heat shrink, red heat shrink, so that it identifies that it's the positive cable. That might be a bit of a fudge, but it might be one way of doing it. But you can't see through this heat shrink, and there is potentially another problem. If someone needs to inspect these lugs to make sure they're fine, you can see on this one, I've got the conductor sitting a bit furry on the side there, but you have no real easy way of inspecting it. And that's where there's a good call for transparent heat shrink. So here we go. As you can see, you do get transparent heat shrink. And that is certainly advisable in many situations where you want to have easy inspection of your connections after you've actually put them together. It allows you to see if there's any issue. You might have a situation where things are getting hot under here and things are going awry and you're not going to see it because it's happening underneath the heat shrink whereas a good transparent heat shrink will allow you to do that. Another note some people might think that it's a good idea to get a soldering iron and solder and tin the end of the wire to keep it all neat and together before they place it into a connector and crimp it but that actually is a big no-no. And the reason behind that is that that hard solder, when you put it in here, potentially is going to have little peaks and ridges which you can't even see. And it won't make a good mechanical and electrical connector connection inside your actual uh, crimp connector here. So you don't want to solder your, your wire in beforehand. You do want the conductors to be free so they can all 
be crimped together inside there and make a good connection with the surrounding barrel of your connector. Right, so here we go. I have this really nice big hefty piece of wire and I've got some nice two heavy duty lugs here. Far better than this cheaper one which is potentially going to fatigue and, and split and cause an issue. So these are nice and solid. They will also carry a lot of current but that's what you need to go and check is to check the specification of your lugs compared to the wire that you're using. Now if we have a look at this bigger one, as you can see the actual gauge is very big and too big. You can see how it bounces around. It might mechanically be gripped in there once I crimp it but obviously the the strength of that mechanical hold and the electrical connection there is potentially an issue. So let's have a look at this lug which seems to be sized better. So if I put that on we can see that it goes in and what you do want to ensure you don't want, you want to ensure that you've got the conductor going into your lug properly. Some lugs and connectors will have an inspection window. Some have them on the top, some may have them on the front and that should allow you to see whether your conductor is pushed down in there firmly and will have a good grip. Now on here you can see I've got a bit of an end where the insulation is back. Should I have that so that it goes right into the lug? No. Because if it goes right in there again it can compromise the kind of grip when you actually crimp it on there and also again reduce the surface area of the, contact, of the conductor contacting with the actual lug itself. So you do want a little bit of the wiring and conductor exposed at the end here so that the insulation does not get in the way of the actual lug but obviously you also don't want too much and in this case I'd say I've probably got a little bit too much exposed. So what we want to do is have this the right length and then if we need to insulate it that's when we're going to use our heat shrink. Right so I've gone and ensured that the now the conductor is cut to the right length so that it does fit nice and snugly down to the tip or the end of the actual lug. It's, it's stopping there and the insulation is just about right up against but it's certainly not going inside the actual lug itself. So at least I've got that little bit exposed just to show that uh, nothing is getting in, in the way of the actual lug itself. So the next thing I want to crimp it on there and then we want to consider putting some heat shrink on it. Right and again it always helps having the right tools for the job just like it is having the, a nice set of wire strippers. If I was to try and battle with a pair of pliers or, or what have you to try and crimp this I'd seriously be straining myself and also not get the good mechanical and electrical uh, connection that we want with this. So again I've got a nice set of ratcheted um, crimpers. They're nice and heavy duty and it makes doing this a nice chore. Nice long handles to give you the leverage and obviously the ratcheting system which ensures that it, it will hold even if you have to release pressure for any reason. Right, so I've got my ratcheting tool ready. I've selected the right size on there so that the actual lug sits in there and is gripped firmly. I've got the actual tool which is going to cause the indent and actually cause the mechanical grip on the wire right in the middle of the lug. If you do have an inspection hole on top, you do not want to do it on top of the inspection hole to deform it. You want to do it away from that but still in a good place where you've got good purchase and it's going to grab the conductor. So here we go, I've got that and now I'm going to crimp it. So there we go, I've got it crimped, it is relatively well placed in the center. The, from the inspection window I can still see that my conductor is sitting at the end, it hasn't slipped out and that's the value of having a little inspection window on your lug because it might have slipped back during the process and you won't realize it. But here we can quite clearly see the conductor is right up against the end. It's got a very good mechanical strength in there. So that looks as though it went really well. So next is the heat shrink. Now one little thing to note, um, for one I don't have a nice piece of transparent uh, heat shrink which is going to fit this but that's ideally what we want to do. But I'm going to use uh, either the red or the black but of course what you want to do before you crimp your connector on, 
you want to have your heat shrink on there ready because it might not fit over the lug. So just note that you want your heat shrink on first unless you can get it on from the back of the cable itself or otherwise you're going to be stuck. Right, so I've got my heat shrink on the actual wire itself and I want to place it so that it goes over here. Why do I want heat shrink on here? Well, for one, it can obviously act as a form of insulation around just the top of the connector here if you don't want this to come into contact with anything else. Two, believe it or not, the heat shrink acts as a mechanical form of strain relief at the end here as well. It does help a little bit to prevent the kind of, if there's any flex on the wire, it adds a little more support so that you don't get a breaking over here on your conductor. So when we put this uh, heat shrink onto the actual lug itself, how far do we go? So if I had to put this heat shrink right up to there and put it on, it would certainly give nice coverage and it's got a good area over here to provide strain relief. However, if this is going on a battery terminal and I've gone and reduced the contact surface over here, I've then created less contact area so potentially I've got a higher resistance and less area for the current to flow through. So you don't want to remove or take away from the contact area you've got here. You want it moved back so that at least you've got the same area that you've got over here and a nice bit of contact area here for when you connect it onto your battery stud. Obviously you don't want it too far back if you want it covering over here. But again, the one issue with this is that it's opaque so you cannot see the connector after the fact. Anyway, let's uh, get the heat shrink on there. Right, so I'm ready to heat my heat shrink to get on there. And I'm pulling out my trusty little butane lighter. And right, so I've got a flame and off I go. Now, there's something I just want to highlight. I've been using this for a while to do my heat shrinking. There are a few issues though. It doesn't provide a nice uniform heat source in terms to get this shrunk on here nicely. It takes a lot of work and heat. The lighter gets hot which is not a good idea and potentially you're going to burn and split your heat shrink which is what you don't want. It's acceptable while you're heating your heat shrink to have a little discoloration but you certainly don't want any kind of charring or anything else because you do want to note that after this is installed if you've got major discoloration, you're not going to know whether there's an issue in its operation or whether it's done from when it was applied. So you don't want any real charring or splitting of this because that can be a sign that something's wrong when it's in operation. So you want it to go on relatively uniform in color without too much discoloration. So what I do for that, I happen to have an old paint stripper gun, which I use. You do, of course, get guns and equipment which are meant for heating evenly. But anyway, this seems to do the job well for me. Right, so that happened quite easily. What you want to be aware of is you do want to apply enough heat so that it shrinks over and properly tightly holds onto the places over here or else it potentially is going to slip off. You do get heat shrink which apparently has got an adhesive side so that it does prevent it from sliding off on insulation. But here I've got a good mechanical connection because I'm going over the lug as well. I haven't covered too much of the lug. There's still a nice piece that's exposed so that we get good contact area for electrical contact. But yet it covers, it nicely covers things up. But as I said with this you can't see what's going on underneath. If I would continued heating it beyond this point, what happens very quickly if you're not careful, especially over the lugs which get hot, it starts splitting and you can have a split underneath which you may not realize and then over time this is going to flake off and, and its functionality is just going to go. So just be wary of that when you are actually putting your heat shrink onto your uh, wire and your connector. And then last but not least, just remember to use your connectors and what have you for the right application. As I realized here, using these spade connectors as a fuse holder is perhaps not the right idea. The materials are not designed for the potential heat created by these fuses. Even over here, again, you can see as a test, and I'll link to the video um, 
here where I've been testing the kind of heat that can be generated in wire and these connections if they're not done correctly and you can see what can happen very easily you can get these plastics melting and they could melt and then cause a short as well so that's potentially an issue I'd always say where you possible avoid using automotive fuses like this go for proper fuse holders and hopefully your glass fuses which are less likely to end up like this right I hope you gain some value from that I do appreciate that I might not know all the ins and outs, so if you certainly have pearls of wisdom and are wiser in this regard, do post your comments below or even consider posting a video response where you show how it should be done or show what can go wrong when it isn't done correctly. Certainly having the right tools does help, so in the link below I'll have a link to my Amazon store where you can either get the actual crimp connectors or tools. You can also consider going to my sponsor tester.co.uk who help keep the show on the road and help me produce these videos. So thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you soon for the next video. Cheers. Tester.co.uk